Uh, well, thank you, Allison. Um, oh yeah, meeting's being recorded. Um, I didn't realize it's been 16 years. Um, who is that on my end? Somewhere? Yeah, that's the thing that didn't pop up. For, like none of the Zoom stuff was popping up for me. Uh, but I can redo it. Um, oh yeah, I see it. I see it. I see it. Sorry, sorry. Um, why is that not? Let me close it here. Okay. Um, let's get us back. No, I just gotta share my screen again. And so, and yes, okay, awesome. The hybrid is always a little tricky. Um, well, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here and share some of my work with you. Um, the title of my talk, The Multifaceted Interplay Between Cognition and Skill to Action, basically lets me talk about whatever I want that my lab does. So it doesn't really mean that much yet. Um, and you guys are gonna have a part in choosing what you hear about as well. Um, but I always like to start with definitions. Um, I know this is a cognitive crowd, so some of this will probably be review for most of you. Um, but I'm going to ask that you all imagine that you are driving in this car, uh, but you're not driving around uh, Philadelphia. You're actually in mainland China. Rules of the road, more or less the same. Um, you're probably going to do just fine. You might have to have Google Maps open or something like that to get around, but you'll probably be OK. However, if you cross over into Hong Kong, being a former British colony, you have to drive on the left side of the road. And now, as you might imagine, you're gonna have to overcome a lot of um, automatic and visual tendencies and you're gonna start to encounter some issues. Um, so first you're gonna have to actively maintain this rule, drive on the left, drive on the left in mind. Um, when you want to make a turn, you're probably gonna have to turn, if you turn right, it's now to the far lane, to the close lane. Uh, so your automatic actions are gonna have to be uh, changed in the service of your current goal. You're gonna have to deploy your attention in different parts of your visual space to monitor for oncoming traffic. And let's say you have to commute back and forth between mainland China and Hong Kong, you're going to have to do some task switching. So these kinds of processes, the active maintenance of your task relevant context, uh, overriding automatic and visual tendencies for your uh, uh, current goals, uh, task switching, these are the kinds of processes I'm referring to interchangeably as cognitive control processes, top-down control processes, things like this. So now I want you to imagine that you're driving for a job interview and you're a little bit late and you really want to get there on time um, and you're really motivated to do really well in this situation, you might imagine that you're going to have some improvement in some of these cognitive control and top-down control processes. Um, and there's a lot of experimental evidence that that kind of thing does occur when you're more motivated. Um, so as Allison mentioned, uh, I do like sports in action. Um, and I always use this example of, um, of golf. Um, so there's a lot of anecdotal and experimental evidence that these kinds of control processes can actually aid our actions, both in terms of learning and performance. Um, so, you know, millions and billions of dollars are spelt on golf instruction every year. People have golf coaches and magazine subscriptions and things like that. And it is actually true that if you have like a golf instructor who says, you know, keep your left arm straight and your downswing, that might actually help your golf game a little bit. Um, at the same time, we all kind of have this intuition that when it's like the big moment and it's like the final date of a tournament, like maybe we don't want to be doing this. Um, so potentially uh, kind of focusing on what your body is doing and, and really trying to control your actions might have some downsides as well. Um, and so again, there's a lot of experimental evidence um, and anecdotal evidence that something like this is happening. Um, so in my lab, we're kind of interested in how all these things play together. Um, so how does cognitive control uh, influence skilled actions? How does motivation impact the balance between um, goal-directed habitual actions and things like this? Um, so we always start with some behavioral experiments and we've been doing a lot of computational modeling of behavior more recently. Once we feel like we have a sense of the kinds of cognitive processes involved, um, we use uh, functional imaging in terms of fMRI to get a sense of the brain areas and the brain networks that are involved in the cognitive processes that we're interested in. And then finally, um, we use uh, non-invasive brain stimulation uh, in the form of TMS, or transcranial magnetic stimulation, to kind of transiently disrupt these areas of the brain that we think are important for these cognitive processes to see how that affects behavior, affects the cognitive processes, and affects um, these large-scale uh, brain networks. So in terms of the outline of the talk, I thought I would start um, with uh, some more behavioral work uh, and some computation modeling, asking this question of how motivation impacts the balance between goal direct and habitual uh, actions. Um, and then after that, um, I'm going to free it up for you guys to tell me what you want to hear about. Um, 
So it's going to be a little bit of a choose your own adventure. Um, I have this little uh, lightning bolt on Charles Barkley's head to uh, remind me to say this is like more recent work that um, I would be excited to talk about, but it kind of depends on what you guys want to hear about. Um, so I'm going to go through those options just to like signpost them, and then we'll return to that and you can choose whichever one of these later. Um, if you like what you hear at first and you like the computational modeling approach, we can talk about what happens after you make an error. So what is the nature of post-error cognitive processing? Um, we could talk about some recent work uh, looking at how reward impacts um, uh, neural representations of skilled motor plans. Um, so this is an fMRI study. Um, this third one is a combined fMRI and TMS study. It's mostly going to talk about the TMS behavioral effects of looking at long-term motor expertise and how um, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is an area of the brain very important for cognitive control processes and primary motor cortex uh, are involved in the development of motor expertise. Um, if you kind of care about motor control, but not really, and you care more about decisions, we could talk about how uh, rewards impact vision motor decision-making. And then finally, if you don't care about action at all, and you just want to talk about uh, kind of more cognitive processes, we can talk about how reward and motivation uh, impacts just working memory um, uh, in isolation. Um, so those are the options. I'll make sure to return to this so you can uh, select it, but I just want to kind of have them in the back of your mind to start with. Um, okay, so let's start with this question. Uh, how does motivation impact the balance between goal-directed and habitual control? Um, so as I alluded to in that introduction uh, with uh, uh, you know, the thought bubble growing, um, there's a lot of experimental evidence that rewards and motivation can actually enhance some um, cognitive control processes. So a typical task that you would see um, is like a Stroop-like task. It's something like this. Um, so in this case, there is an image. It could be a house or a building overlaid on top of that. Um, you could have the word house or building. Um, that word can be congruent with that image. And your job is always to say, is this image a house or building? But if you have the word, um, let's say house in this case, overlaid a building, you might have some conflict. Okay, so pretty classic complex tasks, Stroop tasks, Simon tasks, things like this. And a typical pattern of responses that you see um, in free response time tasks is that when you have um, these neutral trials, so let's say it's an animal word instead of house or building, um, you know, you have some reaction time. Um, in these incongruent cases, you really slow down. These are the times when you need cognitive control to overcome that automatic uh, tendency to respond based on the word. Um, so this slow down is kind of an index of the conflict. Um, and if it's congruent, you actually speed up a little bit. So if both those um, kinds of information are in agreement, you get a little bit faster. Um, so what people have shown is that if you pair, um, if you give people rewards for their performance, so let's say I give reward cues, now you're playing for $20. Uh, what, how does that impact your performance on these kinds of tasks? What you'll see is a pretty general speed up in responses. So everybody's faster at everything, but you particularly get much faster at these incongruent cases. And so this has been taken as evidence that your cognitive control processing is actually enhanced by rewards because you're able to overcome this automatic tendency a little bit better. Um, another way of showing that is by kind of contrasting incongruent trials versus these neutral trials. And so um, that's the subtraction here that I'm showing on the left is interference. And you can see that and no reward, you have some of this big interference cost and reward kind of reduces that cost somewhat, which all seems kind of well and good. Um, except for the fact that you're kind of faster across the board at everything. So you're automatically gonna get kind of a smaller number there. Um, and so this always kind of bugged me that you get this pretty massive reduction and you're much faster at everything. So making inferences about how these cognitive processes are being uh, impacted is a little bit muddy with um, uh, using free response times. And as um, someone who's very interested in motor control, I was very influenced by this work by Adrian Haith. Um, that, geez, that's also a long time ago now. It's uh, eight years ago. Um, say, showing that um, response time, if you use free response times, that might just be confounded just by itself. Um, so I'm gonna kind of walk us through this because it's kind of foundational for both this study and potentially one of the other studies if you choose to go for it. Um, so this is a, a pretty simple motor control task. Um, uh, participants, they can't see their hand, but their job is they start in that start position in the middle. One of these peripheral locations is going to light up in yellow, and they just have to reach out and kind of move their arm past that. Okay, so the simplest of simple free response time tasks you can think about. Um, and so what Adrian and his group did is they had this task, free response times, and what is being plotted here in green is um, the cumulative distribution of response times. So this, um, let me use my laser pointer. So this is saying that 25% of your responses are 200 milliseconds or faster. Basically 100% of your responses are 300 milliseconds or faster. Okay, so this is kind of distribution of responses. And so what Adrian and his colleagues did is that they actually forced people to respond at particular times. Um, I'm gonna talk about how you can do that in a second. But what they saw if you force people to respond very quickly, um, so what's being plotted now is instead of like proportion is now just how accurate you are if I force you to respond at let's say, 
uh, 50 milliseconds. Um, so this is 12 and a half percent is just chance. If I were forced to spawn go very quickly, you just kind of reach out randomly. Um, but pretty quickly, your accuracy starts to rise and you get to basically ceiling levels of performance at around 150 milliseconds. But that's way faster than you'd, than you'd see in any pre-response time task. Um, and so another way of showing that is like this. Um, so um, along the x-axis here is preparation time. So if I force you to respond, each of these dots is one individual. If I force you to respond at 100 milliseconds, this is when you're getting to ceiling levels of performance. And for on the y-axis here is there, each individual is their kind of uh, free response time that you'd estimate as their ceiling level of performance. And basically everybody can go much faster than they choose to go, okay? Um, so specifically, we want to ask this question about um, goal-directed versus habitual actions. Um, so in these kinds of conflict tasks that I showed and a lot of other tasks, they're essentially competing for action selection. We only make one action. Um, but we don't, in humans at least, we never actually see people make these habitual errors. They don't actually um, respond based on the habit. You have to infer their action of this habit by the, sl the, sl the response times. Um, so these habits and these habitual responding automatic response tendencies are often masked by goal-directed responses. And we try to infer what's going on with these kind of habitual processes from this slower RT. Uh, but as I just showed, RT can be a little bit tricky in a lot of different ways. So when I want to ask this question, how does motivation impact the balance between these processes? That can be really hard um, uh, to actually assess with these free response time tasks. Um, so we decided to kind of join these two um, literatures and take some of the stuff from motor control, this um, uh, force response technique that I'm showing in a second, and merge it with a very classic cognitive control task. So in case you haven't seen this, um, it's a Simon task. You're asked to respond with your right hand if it's a uh, green circle, left hand if it's blue. Um, but that stimulus can appear either on the left or the right side of the screen. Um, so if it's on the left, that would be congruent. You have an automatic response tendency to um, respond to the side of the screen. Um, so you can have congruent and incongruent just like those group tasks or other kinds of tasks. Okay, so how do we get people to force, how do we force people to respond? Um, I'm going to do this by way of a little demo just to wake you up a little bit. <laughs> um, so um, what you're going to see is this uh, rectangle is going to fill in black. And when it fills completely, like when, right when it hits the edge, I want you to just clap. Okay. Um, I know people are eating a little bit, a little bit too quick. Uh, there you go. Perfect. Okay. Now, um, same thing, but just snap instead. Okay. Good. Okay. Let's get a little harder. Um, so now I want you to monitor like the central location under here. It's either going to be the clap icon or the snap icon. And so you have to make that response when it fills up. So like, don't go early, but you have to wait to see that stimulus to know what to do. Okay. So you're responding right when it fills up. There you go. Good. A few false steps, but it's pretty good. Couple errors. <laughs> um, there you go. Okay. So hopefully you can uh, feel that like, oh, I can do this. If the stimulus comes pretty late, it can be a little hard to get your timing perfect, but people can do this kind of task. Um, so essentially I get to control, I'm gonna show you on this slide. Um, I get to control when you make your response. And what I vary as the experimenter is when I give you the stimulus, okay? So I can basically vary how much processing time I give you and ask the question of like, okay, if you have 100 milliseconds, this is what your performance can look like. If you have 300 milliseconds, this is what you're gonna look like. Um, so I can vary this and give you a lot of time to prepare or not a lot of time to prepare, okay? Um, and what the data I get out essentially is a speed actually trade-off function looks something like this, okay? So depending on how much processing time I give you, that's what time is going to be, um, I get some accuracy, okay? So um, usually I'm going to put a dotted line if it's chance level accuracy. So if it's too fast, you're just going to snap or clap. You don't know, you have to pick one. Um, but if I give you a little bit of time, you can actually respond based on the stimulus. Um, that makes sense? Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, just a note for um, these force response studies. We only give people timing feedback. We don't give people um, uh, any other feedback about their performance. Um, and here's binary, whether you get the side or the color correct. Right, this one's just two choices. This okay. is two two buttons. It's not the um, uh, eight options or whatever it was for the region. Um, so um, when, in blue and yellow down here is all the stimulus timing that we can sample. So we could sample up to you know a second before. And then um, the histogram here in gray is participants actually respond, actual responses. Um, so they're pretty good about, they're supposed to respond in two and a half seconds on every trial. There's some variability around that, but people can do this task, okay. Um, and we generally, when we analyze this data, we only look at if you're within hundred milliseconds of when you're supposed to respond. Um, okay. 
Um, the other nice thing about using this uh, force response task is that it lends itself really well to this uh, model of cognitive processing about how we prepare our responses. Um, so this looks a little busy, but I'm gonna walk through it slowly. It's, it's actually very, very simple. Um, so we make an assumption that when you prepare a response, there's some mean amount of time that takes and there's some variability, uh, which seems pretty straightforward. It takes me, let's say on average 250 milliseconds, but I'm variable. Um, so we make that assumption. Um, so let's say let's say I knew what that distribution was. I knew what the mean and variability was, and I know how much time I give you. That's what the CL line is. So I give you, let's say, 400 milliseconds. Um, if I know this distribution, then I know the likelihood, uh, how likely you are to have a response ready and how likely that you're not ready yet. Um, so I get those out. Um, so I have a probability that you have something prepared or a probability that you don't and you're just guessing. Um, once I know those, if I assume that if you're guessing, you're actually guessing, um, and it's just a chance. Um, and I make the last assumption that if even if you're ready, sometimes you just mess up. Sometimes you just push you fully prepared, but the wrong response came out, and we can estimate how um, how likely that is to happen. Um, so with just those, um, I can reproduce that speed x trade-off function that I showed you before. Okay, so I just assume that there's some amount of time it takes to prepare a response, um, and that you sometimes guess and sometimes you just mess up. And that gives me back out um, this uh, the data that we get from this experiment. Um, so what uh, my model allows me to do is estimate the latency of how long it takes to prepare these responses, the latency of the cognitive processing necessary to prepare a response. Um, and so in these kinds of conflict situations, um, we make a couple further assumptions. We assume that um, goals and habits are prepared separately, um, that habits are prepared more quickly than goals. I think these are non-controversial, hopefully. Um, that there's some mean preparation time and it varies around that mean. And once the goal is prepared, that it overrides the habit, okay? Um, okay, so I'm gonna get a mean and a standard deviation for both a goal-directed response and a habitual response. Um, and so I could also show that another way of um, how likely it is that one of these responses is ready at a given point in time, okay? So very quickly, it's very likely to have a response prepared and not the goal response in this situation, for example. Okay, so let us let me show you some data. Um, so if I put people on the Simon task, um, what I could do is show you those incongruent and congruent trials separately. Um, so across the x-axis here is that preparation time. So when you see the stimulus, is it 100 milliseconds before or 700 milliseconds before as you respond? Um, again, accuracy on the y-axis, so chance is 50%. Um, if I only give you a couple hundred milliseconds, you're just guessing. Um, in this congruent case where the color and the side of the screen match, you get uh, pretty good pretty quickly. Um, but what you'll see is in the incongruent case, you actually get this dim, okay? So you get your below chance. You're actually making habitual errors. And this is something you don't actually see in humans basically ever. So um, if you're interested in this habit goal conflict, you don't get to actually observe this, but we actually get errors of commission, which is cool. Um, so if we're really interested in that, for example, we could like densely sample these fast times and see how the habit's getting moved around. Um, but pretty quickly after that, uh, your cognitive control kicks in, your goal-directed processing uh, starts to kick in, and you get back up to basically ceiling levels of performance by a full you know, 500 milliseconds or so. So in terms of that model, um, if I fit this model to our behavior, um, this is the output of the model, what the model thinks that our participants do, it reproduces behavior quite well. Um, and how what, what the model thinks is happening is that uh, when you get this dip is when that habit is ready, but the goal isn't ready yet. And the goal comes online and then it comes back up, okay? Um, so what's nice about this modeling approach is it lets us formally um, uh, uh, formalize some hypotheses for what motivation might do to the balance between these processes. So you might think, you know what, when I'm really motivated, I'm really inhibiting habitual responses. That's what I'm doing. Uh, that In our model, that would come out as a shift in this habitual distribution that would have some associated behavioral response in our participants. Um, or I could say that, you know what, what's happening is when you're really motivated and you're rewarded, like all this goal-directed processing is getting boosted up and sped up. And that's why you get better um, in these uh, conflict situations. Um, that would come on our model with a, a shift in distribution of just a goal-directed response and have some uh, associated behavior profile um, or some combination of these kinds of things. Um, so we had folks do this uh, Simon task with uh, cash bonuses. Um, so before every single trial, you'd get a reward value displayed on the screen, either $1 or $5. Um, the way rewards work in most experiments we do in my lab is at the end of the experiment, we pick a trial at random. If you got it right, you get that much money. Um, so it's kind of um, independently um, evaluating reward on every single trial. Um, and so if we do that manipulation, uh, again, I'm going to show you some data from our uh, participants in this experiment. Um, again, accuracy on the y-axis is that preparation time along the x. In orange is those incongruent trials. 
uh, in blue is those congruent trials. And the darker colors is the high reward value and the lighter color is the uh, low reward value, $1. So I want to draw your attention over here to this, this dip. So when you're playing for $1, you get a lot of these habitual errors. When you're playing for $5, you're reducing the amount of those. Okay, so is this some index of like cognitive control actually working and being enhanced by uh, reward? Um, but it can be pretty tricky to just look at this and say, okay, is this like inhibiting habits that's getting better or what is it? Um, so this is where the modeling is very useful. And what we see when we fit our model is that, um, so again, in dark is the uh, uh, high reward value uh, um, condition and in lighter colors is the lower reward value. And we see as we see the shift in the distribution of the gold response and no movement in the habit whatsoever. Um, so my trainees are getting quite fond of using um, uh, Bayesian statistics. So um, you might see some of these kinds of plots. Um, so in lieu of like p-values and things, I'm gonna show you like the evidence posterior distribution. So uh, posterior, um, uh, uh, distribution of, of on a parameter. So what this is the change in the mean of these distributions. Zero B is the exact same distribution. Um, so you'll see the habit. All of our evidence is it's right in the same place, basically. Um, green is the gold dark distribution. And so if it's to the left, that's evidence that's speeding. If it's to the right, it's evidence that's slowing down. And we see that basically all the evidence is that the gold direct response is, is sped up. Okay. Um, so um, we've replicated that uh, effect with uh, arrow assignment tasks just to make sure that it works. Same exact effect, uh, shift on the goal. Um, and this is only in the context of conflict. Um, so I could give you the same kind of task without conflict, respond to color centrally or respond to location. So respond to blue and yellow centrally presented, respond to left to right side of the screen. Um, and I'm gonna just skip to the model. This is the um, behavior, but in, when there's no conflict, you can speed up both. You can speed up location-based responding, speed up, color responses. But in this con uh, conflict situation, it seems that reward is preferentially acting on these goal-directed processing and not doing anything to your inhibition responses. Um, so it seems from uh, this data that rewards and enhanced motivation um, seems to accelerate the preparation of goal-directed actions under conflict and doesn't seem to do much for the habitual actions at all. Um, we're currently doing, actually currently finishing, um, using um, inhibitor TMS over a lot of prefrontal cortex for this exact question to see if Maybe prefrontal cortex, a lot of prefrontal cortex is what's um, helping uh, drive this speed up in goal direct responding. Um, and I'm a pretty big evangelist for these force response paradigms in lieu of using free response time tasks. So happy to talk about that um, if other folks are interested, um, especially if you're interested in kind of like habitual actions that you don't get in humans very much. Um, it could be really a really nice technique. Um, okay. So let's do we do questions at the end or during or? Anything is fine with me, but I'll I'll keep going and then we can hold questions for them, I suppose. Um, so now's the time for you to tell me what you want to hear about. Um, so just to run through these options, um, if you like that force response stuff, we can look at uh, what happens after you make an error. Um, if you uh, are more interested in motor control, I would say two and three is probably more going to be your thing. Um, I'm going to slightly bias us toward three because it's TMS uh, and I'm excited about it. We just uh, submit that paper. Um, so two is more how reward impacts no representations of motor plans. Three is um, how DLPFC and uh, M1, primary motor cortex, are involved in the development of motor skill expertise. Four is that uh, reward visual motor decision-making um, that I talked about. And then five is like, I don't care about action. I just want to know about working memory and what reward is doing for working memory. Um, so I'm going to ask you, to, you can vote for as many as you want. I'm going to like say a number and just raise your hand if that sounds appealing. Uh, so one is, okay, got it, a two. Fewer three, more, cool. I mean, I did put my thumb on the scale, so uh, four, four, four uh, uh, only a few. I'll talk to you about it later. Uh, five, okay, three is the winner. Um, so hopefully my link works. Um, okay, um, I always pick on Charles Barkley and his hideous golf swing, it's really mean, um, but it's a good example. Um, so the question for this one um, is how do we go from you know, this novice hideous golf swing to this smooth, beautiful expert um, action. Um, and so in the lab, we often don't study uh, golf swings uh, for better, for worse. Um, and the task we tend to use for uh, motor skill learning often in lab-based context is um, these motor sequencing tasks. Um, so the task that we use um, for uh, motor skill learning is something like this, where you're gonna see these four boxes on the screen. And then um, each of these boxes is associated with a finger that you have to press. As soon as that 
location, let's say it's leftmost location lights up, you press the associated finger. Uh, so in this case, your index finger. Um, as soon as you press that button, uh, another location lights up. And so you're gonna have to learn to create a, uh, produce a sequence of finger movements, okay? Um, so somewhat similar to a golf swing where you have to like chain together a bunch of different actions to the, make this smooth automatic, automatic action. We can get a sense of uh, somebody's uh, development of motor scale by seeing how quickly you can like kind of chain together these discrete movements. Um, so this task is called the discrete sequence production task. Um, so tasks like this have been used pretty extensively in the motor scale learning literature. And um, the typical story of, um, I say ish, I'm happy to talk about why I say ish, uh, but the canonical story that I, I teach in my intro to cognitive psychology class is that expertise develops in stages. And you have this cognitive stage where early on, you're not very good, you're a novice, and you're really relying on working memory and attention to drive your performance. And then you move to this associative stage where you're kind of chaining together these actions and you're learning what works and what doesn't. And eventually, uh, when you're an expert, you're in this autonomous stage, you can now free up all these working memory resources and cognitive control resources for whatever else you want. You can you know, juggle and talk, have a conversation at the same time once you're an expert. Um, so when you're a novice, you're kind of like the thinker. And then when you're expert, you're just doing it, right? Um, um, and in terms of uh, kind of, I'm going to keep with cortical involvement, uh, mostly because TMS only affects uh, cortex. So I'm going to um, skip over some subcortical stuff, but happy to talk about it later if people are interested in it. Um, but so people have used uh, nermaging mostly to um, have this kind of canonical view of the cortical areas that are involved as you progress through motor skill um, expertise. And early on um, in all these imaging studies, dorsal prefrontal cortex is very hyperactive early on in, in skill training. Um, so DLPFC is very important for working memory uh, process in general and cognitive control process in general. But over time, as you practice, it seems that activity in this area drops off. Um, and it's assumed that um, primary motor cortex and uh, specifically uh, cortical striatal uh, uh, loops are driving um, uh, expert motor performance. But the thing that's always bugged me about this is that if you look at the neuroimaging literature it, and you're just looking at activity in these regions over the course of training, um, activity in both these areas tends to go down with training. Okay, So as you train, DLPFC activity reduces, but also M1 activity reduces. And so you have the same pattern of you know, activity changes, but people say, oh, well, in DLPFC, you're just a release from control and you don't need it anymore. But for M1, it's actually just more efficient and it's like metabolically more efficient. So you're just doing better there, and but it's still critically involved in the motor skill. This always kind of bugged me, especially as a more uh, cognitive person. So I want a little more, <laughs> a little um, more evidence for um, the dissociation between this, how these areas are working. Um, another problem is that um, mean level changes in fMRI activity um, are just a little inconclusive. Um, so this um, is a might be a little tricky if you don't um, do neuromaging, but I'll, I'll try my best to explain what I mean here. Um, so if you're looking at any particular brain area, let's say primary motor cortex. Um, and so the data we get out from uh, neuromaging is in 3D pixels called voxels. Um, so I could just say two voxels in motor cortex. So it's two areas in motor cortex. Um, this is activity in voxel one and activity in voxel two. And each of these dots is a different scale that you have. Okay, and this is activity in these two areas, these two like micro areas of motor cortex when you're uh, doing the sequencing scale. You could say that, um, and so let's say I, I train people up, okay? Um, so you could say like, oh, motor cortex is getting more active. I get additional recruitment in motor cortex. Um, both these areas, both these little voxels are increasing activity. That'd be additional recruitment in this area. Could be increased efficiency, like I talked about. You could drop an activity in both. Um, that maybe that's what's going on in motor cortex. Um, but you could also have a more complex um, level of changes, right? So, um, and specifically, I'm gonna call it this one. It could be that what's going on is that you actually have a separation of the patterns of activity in motor cortex as training develops, okay? So all these blue, oops, all these blue sequences are untrained ones. Activity looks kind of similar, but as you develop expertise, you actually get really nuanced patterns of activity in motor cortex, okay? So if I have a, a super expert skill, it has a very different pattern of activity than a novice skill, and the two expert skills maybe have very different patterns of activity. Um, so um, uh, there's several groups that have been uh, looking at motor skill expertise and how that changes these patterns of activity. And typically, what you see is that these patterns do organize and become more distinct with training. Um, so what I'm showing here is um, um, just the, so this is uh, how similar two untrained sequences are to another. So this is a correlation uh, between the activity in those voxels for untrained skills. It's very similar. So um, this is like a cross-section looking at motor cortex. 
So across a lot of motor cortex, uh, uh, not premotor cortex, I should say, um, patterns of activity are very similar for untrained sequences, but as you train on them, they get more distinct. So the correlation between activity for one expert sequence and another goes down over time. And so you can like kind of build maps of areas that um, become more distinct, the patterns of activity become more distinct with training. Um, one issue with this though, is that people haven't been able to read out from motor cortex uh, these any kind of changes in the pattern of, uh, of uh, activity in relation to uh, motor skill expertise. Um, and there's even some animal work showing that um, if you actually train a, a rat to do a pretty simple motor control task, um, I think it's like a, a little reaching task, um, and you ablate motor cortex, after they're an expert, their performance is actually still fine. Okay, so maybe like maybe you don't need motor cortex for these um, uh, extra motor skills. Um, so all these have uh, led to this question I've had for kind of a long time. It's like, well, okay, um, it seems that we think that motor cortex is really important for extra motor skills. It seems that we think that DLPFC isn't. So what if we in humans try to disrupt these areas and take a look at how disruption impacts uh, performance at various levels of skill? Um, so as you develop expertise, if this area is no longer involved, if I disrupt this area, it should be really impactful for novice skills, um, but less impactful for expert skills. And potentially, uh, um, it, it should just be disruptive across the board for M1. It just doesn't matter if it's expert or novice. If I disrupt M1, maybe it should be bad for you. If it's, if it's an area that's important for motor skill across the board. If it's increased efficiency, then TMS should actually be most disruptive for those expert skills, right? Um, so what we did is we combined that DSP task, that sequence learning task I was telling you about before with TMS. Um, so the sequence learning task is something like this. Um, <clears throat> we give people sequence cues. So we can give you a color cue. Hey, type the blue one. Hey, type the red one. Hey, type the green one. Um, after they see that cue, uh, they see that series of uh, button presses. As soon as they press one, the next one lights up. Over time, participants get really fast at producing these uh, motor sequences. Um, so in this study, we had six different sequences that folks were learning. Um, and we actually trained them over a six-week period. So we had people come in for a baseline session where they uh, saw four of the different sequences. Um, so each of these colors maps on to a uh, different sequence that they had to learn. Um, and then they come back for 24 different training sessions. And uh, critically, during each of these training sessions, we gave them a lot of exposure to certain sequences, a little bit of exposure to some of them, and they each session, they saw uh, a couple sequences just one or two times each. And then so when they come back after six weeks of training, now they're like a novice on a couple of sequences. They're kind of like moderate, okay, at a couple of sequences. And they're like really, really expert, have done thousands of trials on certain sequences. So in these sessions, we could take a look at a particular individual and say, like, okay, this is you in a novice state. This is you in an expert state just in that one session. Um, and then we can combine that with TMS. We can uh, use TMS to disrupt either DLPFC activity just before performance or motor cortex activity just for performance or a control site. Um, for most of our studies, we use like hip area of somatosensory cortex that isn't activated for anybody not involved in the task. Um, and we could see how disruption impacts uh, performance for expert sequences versus uh, minimally trained sequences. Um, okay, so let's get some data again. Um, so what I'm plotting here on the Y is uh, what I'm calling normalized movement time. So this is how, basically how quickly you can do the whole eight item sequence. How quickly can you type out all eight items as a function of how many times you've practiced that sequence? Um, and so people get faster over the course of training. Um, and what's important for this one is that even though the minimally trained ones, they get you know one a day, what matters is how many trials of training they have. So you know 24 trials of training on the minimally trained one, even though it's across days, looks like that first day is extensive. So it's the same kind of learning curve for all these different sequences. Um, and so another way of showing like the difference in skill level is just um, when they come back for that day where we're doing control stimulation, what's their performance on these um, different training depths. So that's what's down here on the X. So it's minimally trained skills at the left. Um, you're relatively slow. Those moderately trained ones, you're faster and you're the fastest for the ones you've trained a lot. Yes. I'm just curious how you deal with trials when they mess up the sequence. So yeah. I these are all- the So, got the yeah. So- Plant uh, oh, accuracy. Uh, so I'm, the movement time is, uh, we know we go. yeah, right. Yeah, we go way back. Um, so movement time, I'm always going to show for just correct trials if you actually correctly press all the buttons. Um, in this task, if you make an error, it abort, it, you get feedback and it aborts the trial. Um, but this isn't a speed accuracy trade off. Um, so they're also the least accurate for the minimally trained ones. Um, so they're slow and not very accurate. 
Um, the moderately and extensively trained ones, they have similar levels of accuracy, but you're much faster at those points. Okay. Um, so um, I didn't mention this yet, but uh, for all those sessions that come back with TMS and that first baseline session, uh, we did some, uh, they were in the scanner. Uh, so we got uh, neuromagy data for all these folks as well. Um, so I could take a look at um, when you come back uh, after training, the difference between minimally trained skills and those extensive skills and try to get a look, take a look at the brain areas involved that are more involved for one versus the other. Um, and so that's what this map is here. And I'm gonna particularly draw your attention to the dorsal prefrontal cortex where you have less activity for um, extensively trained skills and minimally trained skills. But you also see that same pattern in more projects. You have less activity, univariate activity for um, extensive skills versus minimally trained skills. But what happens when we disrupt? Are these areas contributing the same thing? Um, so I'm gonna start with motor cortex because I think most people think the motor cortex is involved for uh, motor skills. Um, so what I'm plotting here along the X is um, the different skill levels again. So the minimally trained sequences, the moderately trained sequence in the middle and the extensively trained sequences uh, on the right. And now I'm, I'm saying um, the difference, how much slower do you get when I disrupt motor cortex versus this control area? Okay, so this is now a, uh, how much slower am I when I disrupt motor cortex versus when I'm not disrupting anything that should be involved. Um, so no matter what level of training depth, there is a cost, you're slower, you're about 4%, 5% slower for the minimally trained ones, but the cost of disruption actually grows as a function of expertise, okay? Um, so you get a bigger cost in performance for these extensively trained skills. Um, if I look at accuracy, I basically see the same kind of pattern. Um, so again, this is a change in accuracy now, how much worse, uh, how many more errors do I make essentially? So down is worse accuracy. Um, you know, there's some cost to accuracy for the minimally trained ones, but you actually see a much bigger cost for the more extensively trained skills, okay? So um, the cost of motor cortex disruption actually grows with expertise. Uh, Are these results pretty uh, consistent across observers or? Across or individuals? Across individuals. Um, yeah, I mean, the error bars give you some sense of that, but yeah, I think it's, we have 20, 21 people. I'm trying to think of how many people show. Um, I don't think I have a plot with all the individuals, but it's, there's not a ton of it. Like this is, uh, within subject error bars, I suppose, but like, basically everybody shows big costs. Um, there are a couple people who, depending on the skill level might flip around a little bit. Um, but in general, you get pretty big costs for M1 disruption. Yeah. Um, if we look at uh, DLPF DLPFC stimulation, we see a slightly different pattern of results. Um, so again, big costs across the board. It doesn't actually matter how expert you are. If you take DLPFC off uh, disrupt activity there, you get slower. Um, if anything, in terms of movement time, like you get a little less slow for extensive. So maybe it's a little bit of drop-up performance. Um, um, but what we see in accuracy is something like pretty stark. Also, you get a big hit to accuracy for these minimally trained. So these novice skills, take DLPFC offline or disrupt activity there, you get a huge cost of performance. As you gain expertise, that cost is actually minimal, uh, relatively minimal. Um, so speed accuracy trade-offs, bane of my existence. That's why I do the force response thing. Uh, but we try to combine them because we have this kind of complex pattern. Um, so we kind of developed this like normalized skill score that's trying to combine speed and actually take a look, get a measure of skill. Um, so this is uh, this change in skill score is the difference um, um, between this active stimulation and this control stimulation when we try to combine speed and action into a single metric. Um, and so I'm gonna walk us through this because I realize it's a little bit busy. Um, so this is that change in skill score down is worse skill. Um, blue is the LPFC simulation. Uh, orange is the M1 simulation. Um, so for these minimally trained skills, uh, let's start with uh, M1. There's a small cost M1, but as you develop expertise, you get the cost grows. So your skill gets worse. For DLPFC, you see the opposite pattern, okay? Uh, so you get this nice uh, dissociation where you actually see the biggest cost is normally trained ones and that actually gets reduced as you as you train, okay? Um, so even though we have that same pattern of fMRI results, we get reduced activity in both areas. It seems like they're doing different things as a function of expertise. Um, so this preprint is up. Um, Actually, much time. Yes. Uh, so the hand representation on M1 is, is actually a little smaller of an area yes. than the DLPFC. Yes. Or, you know, broadly defined. Yes. Right? How, how did you standardize the location? This is a great question. I should have said that when I showed you those TMS sites. Um, so the hand area we defined uh, anatomically. So we found a hand knob for each individual. And then with TMS, we can give a TMS pulse and confirm that we get twitches in the hand. So like very localized. 
for ZLPFC, if you give a pulse, you don't have an output like that. Um, so we define that there's a, a meta-analysis of attention to action. Um, so there's an area like inferior frontal sulcus, basically like um, mid DLPFC, I suppose. So we took that coordinate from a meta-analysis. We confirmed for every individual that on the first day, that area was more a was active uh, during the performance. Um, and we also, um, this is a little bit more, let me show you this slide, oops. Ah. Um, now I have to share that with Zoom again, bear with me guys. Um, okay, this should be this one. And I would like to show you this. And also we get um, at the stimulation site, we also see reductions of activity as a fun function of expertise. So like we think we're hitting the, the right area, which is nice, um, but that's a very good question. Um, okay, um, so the TMS work was able to confirm this dissociable roles for motor cortex DLPFC that you couldn't really see with just neuromaging alone, um, which we're quite excited about. Um, so DLPFC disruption, uh, the cost of that is reduced as a function of expertise, but the cost of M1 disruption grows over the course of expertise. Um, interestingly, though, disruption always has a cost. So it's not like DLPFC does, doesn't matter anymore for these tasks. It's, it's always pretty important. You always get a cost. Um, so it's more of an evolving role rather than it's just dropping out completely. Um, and um, I could talk, actually, I'm just gonna talk about this because this is like uh, preliminary, I would say. Um, I guess we presented it at a conference, but um, so I talked about this pattern separation. So as a function of training, you might, um, so I think I mentioned these people are all in the scanner. Uh, so we get brain activity after TMS. So they get um, inhibitor TMS takes 40 seconds. Disruption lasts about 45 minutes or so. We put them right into the scanner. Um, my TMS lab is like across the hall from the scanner, so we can just walk over and be in there in a few minutes. Um, so one thing we could take a look at is uh, how distinct are patterns of activity for the, so I mentioned that there's two skills, two skills that are extensively trained, for example, two skills of mod trained. So we can take a look at um, how similar patterns of activity are for the two extensively trained skills. And um, we can also take a look at how similar patterns of activity are for these minimally trained skills and how that changes as a function of TMS and this manipulation here shows this as a function of training. So the different skills um, kind of gives us the, how different distinct things get over the course of training as well. Um, I'm just gonna, just cause I think I want to talk about one more thing if we have time. Um, so I'm gonna show you this. Um, so if I look at motor cortex um, and I, um, to get a sense of how distinct these patterns of um, uh, activity are, what I can plot, um, each color is one of the sequences. So the two darker ones um, are extensively trained sequences. The more yellowish ones are the minimally trained sequences and the um, kind of more bluish greeny ones, the mildly trained sequences. And I'm, this is just a uh, way of rescaling to show you how, how far apart these patterns of activity are basically. So it's nice in motor cortex, they're all like pretty far. All the different skills are like kind of different, like far, far apart. Um, and when we disrupt that area and look at how different these patterns of activity are, they all kind of get shrunk together. Okay, so we're really disrupting these patterns of activity, making everything look actually more similar. That leads to worse performance. Less distinct patterns of activity leading to worse performance. Um, in DLPFC, what's interesting for these, um, I think I mentioned that the yellow ones are the novice skills. So you have this big distance between the two novice skills that tend to actually shrink a little bit, it looks like, as expertise is developed. But when we disrupt that area, again, we kind of ruin these representations a little bit. Um, so this is preliminary, but it's exciting. So I figured I'd, I saw these and I was like, oh, this is so cool. Um, this over here I thought was really neat actually. Um, but stay tuned for that one. It's not not quite ready for prep time, but I thought I'd sign this um, Okay, I think there's time for to vote on one more. <laughs> um, uh, two is, uh, I, I'm trying to think of which, Ah, whatever you guys pick whatever you want um two might take a little longer than the time we have but um so just to remind you one is that force response what happens after an error uh two is reward and uh, motor scale representations as uh, specific motor plans four is vision more decision making and um uh, what happens when william tell has to shoot an apple off his son uh and then uh, it'll make sense if you choose four and then five is just working memory, <laughs> working memory by itself and how reward impacts that. Um, so I'll let you vote again. I'll do it quickly. One, uh, okay, two, okay, three, uh, three, I did four, more, five, 
Uh, four? Again, it was four and five. Four, five? I think it's four. Okay. Um, William and Tell. I, I shouldn't have said something. William Tell. I, again, for my thumb on the scale. Okay. Um, the only tough thing about doing choose your own adventures transitions between studies is like not practiced. So um, we're just going to go with William Tell. Um, so I'm assuming many of you are familiar with the story of William Tell, but if you're not, um, William Tell was a, uh, as the story goes, was like an expert marksman. Um, and he insulted the local magistrate in some way. I can't remember exactly how. And that guy was kind of an asshole. And he said that like, uh, you have to shoot, if you're such a good marksman, you're going to have to shoot an apple off the uh, top of your son's head. If you miss, I kill you both. Uh, good luck. Um, so my question is, when you're in, if you're in this situation, uh, where should William Tell aim? This is a very high pressure situation. He really wants to do well. Where should he aim in this situation? Uh, at the apple. <laughs> it gets a little more comfortable. No. <laughs> we'll get. We'll come back to it. <laughs> we'll come back. To it. But you don't want to. You know, you don't want to hurt your son. Um, so uh, slide aside, but it'll make sense in a second. Uh, so um, now you're in Vegas, and William Tell is not around anymore. Um, and you have to choose what slot machine you want to play. Um, so the slot machine on the left, I'm going to tell you, is a 50% chance of losing $10 and a 50% chance of winning $20. The slot machine on the right is a 90% chance of losing $100, but you have a 10% chance of winning $1,000. Which slot machine do you pick? Uh, who says the left one? Who says the right one? Because I understand expected value. Um, <laughs> so um, the expected value of the left one is lower than the expected value of the right one. If you play the slot machine in perpetuity, you'd earn more money on the right one, um, but people pick the left one. Um, so uh, the optimal decision maximizes expected value, but people don't do that. There's a whole host of bias and heuristics that we know about that lead people to um, uh, behave suboptimally. And particularly, um, people are what's called loss averse. Um, so um, uh, what I'm plotting on the uh, x-axis is just the amount, the actual dollar amount of loss and gain. And the y-axis is like the value felt by the individual. Um, and so, um, so losing $50 or winning $50, they feel subjectively different. Um, losing $50 tends to feel, especially for larger losses, feels much worse than $50 feels good. Um, so people typically uh, would rather not lose as much as they, they tend to avoid uh, uh, losses of the same magnitude. Um, but there's other bias and heuristics that we have, for example, uh, satisfying. So instead of two slot machines, let's say there's like now 20 or 30 slot machines, you could exhaustively go through each one. But probably what you're going to do is you're going to find one that's good enough and just play that one. And um, it's good enough for you. OK, so we're going back to William Tell. Um, so vision motor planning is a decision-making task, too. So where should you aim is a decision. Um, you could choose to aim at the center of the apple. Um, you have some variability in your response. So there's going to be, you might hit the apple. But you know, over trials, you're going to do something around that aim points. Um, you might hit the apple if you aim at the center of the apple. Um, you also might miss, and you also might have something really bad happen if you aim at the center of the apple, right? Uh, and there's some probability that each of these things is going to happen depending on where you choose to aim. Um, depending on how much you value these outcomes, you might choose to aim somewhere else, and that's going to have its own associated probabilities for everything, okay? So this is essentially choosing where to aim is like choosing a slot machine. Um, and depending where you aim, there's some, depending on how much value you assign to hitting the apple versus missing versus, you know, that terrible outcome, uh, you can assign an expected value for each of these aim points. Um, and um, so Traumers Housing and Colleagues, this is 20 years ago now, um, had this idea that if you uh, transform economic decisions into vision mode decision-making tasks, you might see that people actually perform optimally. Um, and the intuition was that your motor system uh, is really, really, really good at optimizing biomechanical costs. So um, energy efficiency, minimizing torque and variability, it's like automatically on the fly does all these things. So they thought, okay, if we transform these economic decisions into decisions about where to move, maybe we'll see that people's decision-making get better. Um, so the task they do is something like this, where you'll see a computer screen like this. You have to reach out and touch the, it's a touchscreen monitor, touch somewhere on the screen. If you land in this $1 circle, you get a dollar. If you land in this minus 10, um, you'll lose $10 from your running total. If you land in the middle, you'll get uh, plus one minus 10, so uh, minus nine. And if you miss and you're on the outside, you just get zero, okay? Um, so essentially choosing where to aim is picking, uh, accepting a gamble of some sort. Um, and so um, 
what they found, so what um, this, uh, here we go. Um, so what I'm plotting down here is just that configuration. So the, the green is that reward uh, circle, red is that penalty circle. And this landscape I'm showing is the expected, so given someone's motor variability, there is a maximal place that you should aim to earn the most money, okay? So I can calculate, if I know your motor variability, I can have you reach out and just touch the screen and see how variable you are, like a dot. If I know that, I could say, this is where you should aim, uh, optimally. Um, you can get people to do the experiment. You can see where they end up, their endpoints are. Uh, we make the inference that the average of that is where you were aiming, because there's some variability around that. Um, and it turns out uh, that from this work, it looked like people were aiming at the optimal point. Okay, so um, on the x-axis is where people's, uh, each of these dots is a single individual. Um, on the x-axis where they were aiming and on the, uh, sorry, on the y-axis is where they were aiming. On the x-axis, like given I know your motor variability, this is where you should aim, this is how far over you should aim. And people are pretty hugging that line pretty nice, okay? Um, and so, uh, so then we're gonna, sorry, this is like really jumping around, but now we're going back to William Tell for a second. Um, so I have uh, a few papers um, looking at choking under pressure. Um, so I remember Charles Barkley and his hideous swing, like when he's most motivated, he does poorly. And I have a few papers showing that when, mo when money values get really big, you actually do really poorly at these motor control tasks. So I, this result always kind of bugged me because I was like, well, if you have like five cents, 10 cents, sure. But if it's big money values, you're going to show the same loss aversion stuff that you did before. Um, so, um, and one thing that also bugged me with that prior work was that they compared performance to like this optimal model, but like no other it's like, yeah, it looks kind of like optimal. Um, I mean, and it's compelling, but it's like, what about other possibilities? Um, so um, we decided to do this task with big money values and um, compare multiple models to see what describes behavior the best. Um, so we had people do this reaching task. You like hit, touch the space bar. Um, when you see this bounding box, the, that those two circles can appear anywhere in there. And as soon as they light up, you have to reach out and touch it. Um, we train people to just reach out and touch. So we get their motor variability in a separate day. And then we say, okay, you're gonna be playing for cash bonuses on day two. Um, and then, so what we manipulated was this loss penalty ratio. So we can have people play for plus $1, minus $1, minus $5, minus $1, or um, oh, I didn't show the, oh, and that's the, the ratios. Um, so I can say even money or like big money, um, loss are really big. We could actually did, I think 15 and $3 for some or one and five on other ones. Um, and so we, then we also can, now we could formalize kind of loss aversion and optimal and other things in different models. Um, so we can have the optimal model, like given your motor variability, you should reach here. Um, then we could also have, for example, a um, loss averse model. It's like, okay, I can measure your loss aversion in a classic economic decision-making task. I can get an exact value of how much you uh, um, dislike losing. So we can have a parameter, lambda, that's how loss averse you are. And we could put that back in our model. And it's like, okay, if you're loss averse, as you show in this economic decision-making task, you should actually reach over here. This is optimal for, your loss averse self should reach over here to like maintain your um, values. Um, and then, uh, so then we can see where you actually reached and we know how far off um, you are from um, where the model predicts. Um, and then you can see um, based on this other model, we predict you're over here, but that's like, doesn't describe your data as well. Okay, um, hopefully this kind of makes sense. So we can see, is your aim point basically closer to this where the optimal model predicts or where the um, loss versus model predicts? Um, okay, um, so what I'm plotting here is um, um, kind of that uh, model fit. Um, in green is that optimal model, uh, maximum expected value. In uh, purple here is maximum expected loss averse value. Um, so people's behavior is actually better described by this optimal model than the loss averse model. Um, and that doesn't matter if the reward and penalty values are similar, uh, similar scale or uh, a large scale, it seems like, um, so this is where the model predicts you should aim, this is where people actually aim. So people seem to be closer to optimal. Uh, they're not loss averse, but they, they, when you actually look at behavior, they're, like, they're not actually optimal either. Um, so it might be hard to see if you're far back, maybe look at one of the other screens if you're far back. Um, so uh, triangles where the optimal model says you should aim for this person. Uh, square is where the loss averse model says you should aim. Um, so for the kind of lower reward and penalty values, people are pretty optimal. But the big ones, they're like nowhere close to either of those. They're actually like really bad. Um, and so uh, this led us to come up with, um, it's like, hey, maybe loss averse is eliminated, but you still have other bias and heuristics at play. Um, 
So uh, after seeing some pilot data, we uh, developed this satisfying model that's like, you know what, maybe people just get in this high pressure situation, they're just freaked out and they're just like, hey, I'm just gonna go here and do it. Um, so this model is supposed to like kind of encapsulate that kind of behavior. Um, so this model is like, I initially called it the dumb model when we were in lab, this is the dumb model. Um, if there's no penalty value, you just aim at the center of the reward circle. Um, if there is a penalty, you just aim halfway in between. That's it's that uh, this is good points good enough. I don't know. I don't want to calculate it. Um, and so um, that is going to be in orange here, this H heuristic model. Um, and so what you'll see is like, yeah, again, this is a new data now. Loss averse model doesn't predict behavior at all. Optimal is pretty good, but actually the heuristic model does actually um, uh, much better, actually, um, especially when these reward values get the reward penalty ratios get really big people aren't optimal. They're just doing this heuristic thing where they're just like, oh, let's just go right here. Um, and if I show you each of our participants, um, so um, zero uh, is both models, the optimal model and the heuristic model fit equally well for that person. Up and yellow is the optimal, um, the um, optimal model fits better and down is the heuristic model fits better. Okay, so this is each of our individuals. When their reward and penalty values are pretty similar, most people seem pretty optimal. They're better described as optimal models uh, predictions. But like everybody at these high reward values, like everybody's doing this heuristic thing. Nobody's doing this optimal thing anymore. Um, okay. Um, so hopefully that's to you that uh, vision, motor decision, vision motor decisions are still suboptimal. They're not actually optimal at these large reward values. Um, loss aversion seems to be eliminated by transforming into this motor decision, but it's not like you can just like get rid of all the bias and heuristics that we know about from economic decision making. Um, I didn't really talk, talk to you guys about choking under pressure. Actually, I'm realizing. Um, so I kind of had, the, I was going into this, like, oh, people are for sure going to choke under pressure on these high reward value trials. And they're doing worse. Is this, do I actually think this is like choking under pressure? I'm not 100% sure. It seems like people maybe are just like adopting this heuristic that's like good enough for this task for them. Uh, but it does seem to be only when these like penalty values are really good. Um, okay, so I think, hopefully have my links all work. Okay, so um, just with, I think I'm going to wrap up there. Um, so we're doing a lot of different things. I'm happy to talk later with folks if they're interested in any of this stuff. Um, motivation, action, and Parkinson's disease. Um, I didn't get to talk about any of the working memory stuff, but we're really interested in um, how the cerebellum, which is a motor control structure, canonically thought of as a motor control structure, is actually very important for a lot of cognitive processes. We're doing a lot of work on that as well. Um, so please, please feel free to come chat with me later if you would like. Um, I had to put everybody up because I wasn't sure what you guys were going to talk about. Um, so Tyler is in the middle. Tyler Adkins uh, was the first author on the two book-ended ones. So the force response stuff and the heuristics one. Um, and then Quinn, Quinn Wen is uh, has had the Herculean task of doing all the six weeks of training and TMS and multi-sessions um, that was uh, disrupted by the pandemic halfway through grad school for her, which was really tough, um, but she made it through and it's great. Um, and hopefully we get a lot of papers out of this data set. <laughs> um, and finally, uh, thanks to some funders and thanks for you all for your attention. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to take questions if there are any. Yes. Okay. So I feel like my question maybe was totally answered by your last question. So I was thinking about the moderately versus extensively trained sequences yes. and how they look basically the same. And Similar. Then, well, at some point, just like never get any better. Um, they do get better. They do, but not a lot. Right? Not a lot not better. Like, right? Like, um, sort of like end up at a good enough Yeah. Region. So I think one of the, um, let me put this, oops. Let me put this one of the tricky things is that like, um, you uh, use this. You very quickly get like a lot better, and then like going from like oh I'm a let's say a high school athlete to like no I'm playing professional is like the difference in skill might not be that big in terms of like the entire skill, but it's actually it takes years and years and years and years to improve that. Um, so I, and there's gonna be asymptotes in performance. Uh, let's go I, to. I guess my question is like how do you get people to push through that? Right? Oh, like, yeah, that's a hard to not satisfy, to not give up, and actually do that really hard not to win. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would be speculating. <laughs> um, I mean, they have to be motivated by something, right? To keep 
going and practicing. I mean, a lot of it is like just doing the practice and having to there's a lot. There's a whole literature on like deliberate practice for improvement is like what ends up working uh, as you develop expertise. Um, there's a whole host of people trying to figure out what separates those people who do and don't that um, is usually cross-sectional stuff, but. Um, okay, cool. The brain question is like, yeah, all of your outcomes are the same for modern. So, is there like a place you could CMS? Mm -hmm. Um, we will ask, uh, I think this is what you're referring to. I think is that like, uh, modern extensive look pretty similar. Um, for DLPFC, it doesn't, but for M1, it does for sure. It looks almost identical for modern extensive. Um, is there another area? Uh, tell NH to say yes to our grant. Because, uh, <laughs> um, so like I started mostly because I'm more, I have a lot of cognitive control interest. I started with like, okay, M1, everybody thinks involved. DLPFC, nobody thinks should be involved, but we have this pattern. Um, so we started there. Um, this takes a long time and costs money. So, but I would like to do like basically entire motor hierarchy. So I'd like to do like motor cortex, like dorsal motor cortex, something and like see the contribution of all these because you, when you do neuroimaging studies, like the, the pattern over expertise, like it doesn't really make sense across these areas, given what we think these areas are doing. So I think I would like to ask that question, but I don't know. Ask me in five years when I come back. <laughs> I'll have an answer, hopefully. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously, there's no like cognitive control manipulation here. So we're making this like reverse inference. Like, hey, DLPFC seems to be important for working memory attention. Um, I mean, there are cognitive control processes that you need to do this task well. Um, so, for example, especially this is, we kind of biased it a little bit. Um, this is a cue task. This isn't implicit learning. It's like, hey, it's a cue. You're going to type the red one, wait a couple seconds, and then type it out. Like, that's a very, like, working memory dependent kind of thing. Um, and so, like, I can't say with this data. So, I would like to do this again also with, like, no cue. So, you just, like, just do reactions on the screen. It, it might turn out that DLPFC is less involved in that kind of situation. Um, I would argue in most situations you kind of know like roughly what you're supposed to be doing um um so like does it our data is suggesting that you kind of need these cognitive resources the whole it doesn't matter how expert you are like yeah it's it's a little less important later on but like yeah, you kind of do need it the whole time um whether like where the skill resides is like shifting is like a little trickier thing to say i mean i think there's there is a lot of evidence that you get a lot of remapping in primary motor areas for like skills um and like the expanse of the area of cortex that are involved changes a little bit in motor areas. Um, and they have these rodent studies that are like, yeah, actually you have um, basically sensory motor striatum to motor cortex is what's doing everything. That seems to be, that's the system that has to learn to do these tasks well. Um, so I don't know if it's like changing completely, but like it, it's, there are alterations as skills develop, you know? Um, I don't know if that answered your question well, but, um, and then I think, you had a question? Yeah, uh, yeah, I had a question off the, the last study. Sure. I, it, it's surprising to me, the, the, the results is surprising because I, if, if I understand correctly, it looks like people are, you're getting the opposite of loss aversion. Yeah. Ambiguously. Yeah. And so this I one. wonder, uh, explain again how the incentivization works and, sure. how, get, and how much how much training do they get in the past? Like at what point in the, uh, uh, how much training have they had before we're measuring their performance? Um, um, so then, they- How much feedback are they getting? Yeah. How much do they want or loss at that point? Great questions. Um, so reaching itself, I'd say they have a whole lifetime of experience yeah. in reaching. Um, so they're very good at reaching. Um, this task, like, hey, aim at this reward circle and penalty circle, they come in for like 40 minutes on a day. Um, and essentially we just have them get familiar with the touch screen. So it's like, reach out and touch this location. Now we're going to move it around. So we get set. most of that first day is the motor variability. And then at the very end of the first day, they get like 50 trials of, um, so they, they do get the reach, try to hit the circle and avoid that circle, but it's like no consequences for 50 trials. So people like, they understand what they're doing, but the 
actual monetary rewards and penalties are only introduced that are they're going to get paid out on the second hit. Um, so it's like very fresh for them. Um, like I said, for the other reward study, the way rewards work um, for um, all of our studies is we don't want people to accumulate rewards um, because what tends to happen is if you've accumulated a lot of rewards at the end of the experiment, you're like, yeah, I now have a bank. I don't care anymore. Um, so for this experiment, I think we did it block wise. So I think there were eight blocks. At the end of every block, we pick a trial at random. You get wherever you hit, we'll show you where you hit and like you get that much money into your bank or whatever. So, um, so I think people on average made I don't know, more than five, less than $15 bonus at the end. Um, but they weren't like accumulating through. It was kind of a random probablistic thing for them. Um, and did they, did they get feedback on each trial? They see where they, they hit. hit. They they do see the feedback of and, where their end point was. So they know. Infer, yeah. you know, so over one minus five. Yeah. So like, you don't know which of those are going to pick, but at the end of a block, you're like, oh, I had a lot of them that I was in the penalty or um, a lot of them that I was like off completely or whatever. Um, and I think, and is there, I, yeah. is there any movement over the course of that one session as to where they're? Ooh, that's a good they're question. Really, yeah, um, where, so, where I, are they? Yeah, so I think pretty for, stable from. Yeah, yeah, so the question is: is there does their aim point move as a function of blocks? I'm sure we looked at that, and I'm trying to remember. Um, I don't. I oh, I, do I have a slide? It's been a while since anybody voted for this one. <laughs> um, um right so uh that's for the reward though one interesting thing that came out um was um i thought this was like one of the cooler results actually that we need to follow up on is that it's not about training but it's about reward is that your variability actually shrinks when the penalties and rewards are very big like so you have like a tighter which is cool um we did the same plot with i i don't think it i don't think the, the motor variability changed over time i think we looked at the day one i don't remember if the aim point and the reward one i don't I'm assuming if it was there, I would have put it. So I'm, I'm going to say that it didn't exist or it was very small. Um, so I think it's pretty stable. But the, the tough thing is we have to, we infer the endpoint over a cloud of points. I, have, I need a bunch of trials to infer where it was. So I'm pretty sure we did like first half a block, second half a block. And I don't, I don't think we fit the models that separately, but it didn't look very different as, as my recollection. Um, and so like people aren't loss averse in situation, but I think it's just a different decision. Like it's a different context and, um, I, nobody nobody understands this as I'm pulling a bunch of slot machines. People are like, ah, I want to earn some money. Let's like, let's do this thing, you know? Um, oh, this is, is an important one. I don't know. Let's go, you know? Um, so I think I think people are just like, especially because the, I don't think the motor system has access to these reward values. That's a cognitive thing. And it's like, hey, let's do this. Let's, and the motor, to my, in my opinion, the motor system's not going to like optimally calculate reward values because it doesn't have reward. That's not biomechanical rewards and costs. So yeah. Um, um yeah so I, I i do think the loss version is eliminated in these when you transform these tasks but i think it's just you have some other here six state governor behavior i think um yes if i'm not mistaken that 2003 trauma cycle paper um also manipulated the variability of the motor response by changing how much time the subject yeah. has yeah. to make the response mm -hmm. so shorter responses are going to be associated with more variable uh endpoint yeah <laughs> So I'm wondering if you did some manipulation like that, we whether did. there were any effects looking at that. So we didn't do that. There was some work, uh, maybe like almost, maybe even a decade, decade ago now, where you can induce, you can give people feedback that's like, uh, you, you can induce variability in their movement and their input feedback. And um, that work was more in line with like, oh, actually people can optimally integrate this noise you put on their mood movement. It looks like kind of optimal again. But then if you look at it, at the larger reward values, it doesn't. I, I think it's still governed by this, but we didn't actually manipulate that here, so I I don't know. Um, I mean, I kind of to that point, it's like kind of interesting that they actually change their variability based on the um, reward value, so like it gets a little complicated. I don't think it's like static variability. And I think there's yeah. Um, do you have to do any like analysis of like sociology to see if um, someone's resource loss aversion like the first part was in like economic class? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I don't know. That I'm positive it's been done. I'm also pretty positive. I would say the wrong thing if I had tried to guess. Um, but I know it's been done. I, you can search, I think. Um, I thought there was somebody. No, nobody else. Okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, oh, 